Well, maybe we should get started. We have some folks are here. There may be others who join, but it probably makes sense for us to get going. So welcome to the, um, to the uh, presentation, the AIA Philadelphia and Pennsylvania Design Awards. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Framework for Design Excellence and the Design Awards Program um, uh, framework tool that we've uh, updated again this year. So I'll turn it over to Brian, who's going to start us off. Okay, great. Well, thanks and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm Brian Smiley. I'm uh, the chair of the Pennsylvania Coat and on the AIA Philadelphia board. Um, I'll let Jonathan and, and Sherman uh, introduce themselves uh, briefly if you want to do that now. Great. I'm Jonathan Weiss. Um, I'm a, a sustainability director at Jacobs and I'm a member of AIA Philadelphia Coat and also a member of AIA Pennsylvania Coat. And I'm Sherman Aronson, a member of AIA Philadelphia Coat and AIPA Coat, and I'm glad to help out. Great. All right. Thanks. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, uh, so I'm not going to read through their learning objectives, but uh, if you're here to learn about the framework for design excellence and the, uh, the way to submit your awards uh, form, then you're in the right place. So, next slide. So the COAT committee, who, what is COAT? For those that don't know, COAT or Committee on the Environment is a committee with the American Institute of Architects that's been around for roughly 30 years. It was formed in 1990, and shortly after it was formed, um, you know, they, they wanted to incorporate more sustainability concepts into the AIA Design Awards and quickly realized that they needed a separate award for sustainable buildings just to recognize the particular concepts and technical aspects of those types of projects. And in 1997, the Coat Top 10 Awards was launched. Uh, and I want to note that this was three years before the lead rating system was even released. And the awards essentially reinformed, uh, you know, reinforced the COAT mission, that is to advance, disseminate, and advocate to the profession and the public and the building industry that design practices that integrate the nat natural systems and enhance both the design quality and environmental performance of the built environment are really important. So um, the Committee on the Environment has exemplary credibility. This network of professionals represents a broad range of sustainability leaders, practitioners, and experts that frequently act as jurors on these awards and help formulate position statements for the AIA on climate and sustainability. So next slide. So what are the top 10 awards? The top 10 awards essentially evolved to be the most respected sustainable buildings, building awards program. And it frequently, they make big news. They're often covered in the mainstream press in USA Today, Time, Newsweek, uh, The Atlantic, Fast Company, uh, you know, Wired, um, PBS, uh, you know, many news outlets will cover it. And 10 projects each year are given the award and they're based off of these 10 sustainability measures that uh, we'll be covering for you today. In 2016, Coat released Lessons from the Leading Edge, which was a document that captured the exemplary projects from the past 20 years of the award program and examined them for common themes and concepts that were used in these award-winning projects. In 2019, the top 10 awards were reframed as the framework for design excellence. And in uh, around 2020, AI Philadelphia, as one of the the 17 largest AIA chapters in the United States agreed to adopt the framework for design excellence as metrics for all of their design awards and to accomplish that by 2021. Um, and in Pennsylvania, the framework is a voluntary awards program for projects that are pursuing a specific COAT sustainability award. So next slide. So the progression from an awards program and adopting the framework as more of a design philosophy that could be adopted to all 
of uh, the projects in a particular firm's portfolio um, was really reinforcing what the AIA had been on a, on a pathway or trajectory to um, re-envision and reinforce the importance of climate and sustainability in all projects. So the AIA over the past couple of years has been revising their code of ethics and writing resolutions. And really what they wanted to do was to leverage the expertise of these code awards. Um, and as I said, make those into a design philosophy that firms could use on all of their projects rather than just a few exemplary ones that were um, destined for uh, winning awards. And now we're at a point where we're actually taking that design philosophy. We want firms to apply it to all their projects. And we're reflecting that in the AIA awards program in Philadelphia, where all projects have to submit the um, the framework for design excellence form that we'll review with you today. And really we want, um, you know, these award winning projects to um, continue to inform the rest of your portfolio. But really the intent by making this required in Philadelphia is that all projects will have some degree of sustainability. Uh, and, and again, in Pennsylvania, it's our hope that some, at some point that also becomes a requirement for all design awards. Um, but again, at this point, it's, it's just um, voluntary for those. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Jonathan, who's going to give an overview of the uh, COAT top 10 measures that are used in the award spreadsheet. Thanks, Brian. So I'm going to really just talk about what the 10 measures are and I know that the beginning part, we talked a lot about the COAT Top 10 Awards, and you might be saying, yes, but we're not submitting for the COAT Top 10 Awards. But I think it's worth saying that this framework is being used not only by AIA Pennsylvania and AIA Philadelphia, it's being used AIA National and other chapters around the country. So for all of your firms, it's important to understand the framework and understand how your projects might apply. So before the framework came out in this fashion, I think it was common to say, well, on my project is sustainable because I did lead. Or, and if I didn't do lead, it wasn't sustainable. And by breaking it down into these measures, it really should form an opportunity for all of us on our design teams to understand what are the different aspects that this sort of broader group of industry leaders have identified of many different aspects of sustainability. It goes beyond, did you get a particular certification or not? Um, it's still important if you did, but it's not the only aspect, and I think it's worth saying. So I'll quickly go through these 10, um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the form. So the first one is designed for integration. And so this slide has some of the high level comments about what that means. Did the project um, work to integrate different strategies of sustainability and find synergies between different priorities? Um, and I'll, I think a lot of people talk about integrated design but there's a number of different sort of key milestones in a project that's going beyond a business as usual project. The next category is design for equitable communities. Um, and this is really about how did your project go outside the boundaries of your direct client stakeholders and, and connect with the communities in which the, the project is built, the communities that are impacted by the project. And this is something that um, is, you know, extremely important as, you know, the, the design world has a big impact on the communities we build in. And so we wanna understand how did your project um, fit into that and, uh, and work with the local community in whatever ways that it could. The next is design for ecosystem. So this is one that's really, how did the project you know, meet the site? The, the project has a specific place that it's built um, and did it work with the natural ecosystem services of that site or did it work against them? And in what ways were you able to um, understand how the natural sense of what that site was and has been and is turning into and how does your project help with that? Um, the next category is designed for water. And so for all projects, there are challenges related to water and it may be that it's too much water and it may be that it's too little water but in all cases, there are ways in which your project may have gone beyond, I turned on the tap and the water came out and I opened the drain and the water went away. Um, so this is looking at a couple of different strategies and how you're, you're meeting those. Um, 
The next category is designed for economy. Um, and so part of this is that there is a sustainable value to living within our means and getting the most for what our budgets are. We recognize that all projects have challenges and there's certain ways of prioritizing what we can do. Um, so there's a couple of different questions about design for economy. One that you're probably familiar with is design for energy. So a big part of our, the impacts of our buildings is the energy that we use to run the buildings. Are there passive strategies that reduce the amount of energy we need? Are there efficient man manners to use less of the energy to do the same things? Um, and are there clean sources of energy that can be used for the power that we need to, to feed our buildings? The next measure is design for well-being. So there, this goes, uh, some of your projects may be pursuing the well-building standard, but regardless of that, there are some strategies associated with occupant health and well-being and comfort. Are there places that, um, that can address the holistic nature of the people who will be living in, working in, visiting the projects that you're building? Design for resources is really one that talks about what are the components that make your building? What are the materials that are used? Um, and how does the use of them um, impact the environment, you know, both in terms of the life cycle analysis of the materials you're using, as well as um, how waste will be managed both during the construction and during the operation of the building? Are there strategies that can reduce the environmental impact of resources based on your project? The next one is designed for change. So this is about, it's partly about resources. It's about have you designed a building that um, can adapt and change as needs change, whether that's a change of uh, environmental changes, whether that's a change of use or use type, can you reuse that building so it will become a long living building? Um, this category used to be called long life loose fit, which was really about how can your building adapt over time? Many of these buildings we build could last for 80, 100, 200 years. And we know that things are a lot different now than they were 80 years ago. Um, what will they be like 80 years from now? And the last of the 10 categories is designed for discovery. How does your project help future projects, either future uh, folks at, you know, within your client group and your community, how have you learned from your project and how are you using that to inform the community, uh, your future clients and your clients' uh, future projects? So um, there's a number of different strategies associated with design for discovery. And that seems like a mouthful. There are a lot of different measures associated, um, but I think that um, it's worth mentioning you know, the, the requirement that the framework for design excellence is the set of criteria used for assessing project performance was adopted by the AIA in 2019. And this note that's on this slide is both on the AIA national website for awards. And it's also the, the tone that we're taking with our design awards. I think we don't want to scare people off by thinking you need to have every project be a code top 10 project. We need to understand how your projects have addressed these 10 measures with the understanding that with every project, there will be some measures that you're addressing more strongly than others based on any number of factors. And we wanna make sure we understand what those are. So I think it's probably worth re repeating that, that the projects submitted do not need to address all the measures included in the framework. They need to highlight how they perform and then uh, include relative uh, narratives and metrics of the of the measures for which they do um, address those items. And I think, Sherman, is this this is your next? You're coming up next. Okay. All right. We'll jump to the the framework, and um, it is on the AIA website. Uh, has been for the last couple of years, and it's really a terrific resource. Every um, fr from the main page of the Framework for Design Excellence, you see a little snapshot 
uh, recapping of what Jonathan was just talking about for each of the 10 measures. And that gives you a, a sort of once over look and a reminder of, of the breadth of the measures. Then um, you can go to any of those 10 measures and expand. So the next slide shows the focus topics, for instance, on designing for equitable communities. And across the bottom, there are tabs for high impact strategies, best practices, resources, uh, a range of resources from um, you know, uh, pamphlets and, and analysis and, and reports uh, to uh, project uh, uh, case studies. So the case studies of exemplary projects is also a great resource. So you can really dig into each of the measures if you're trying to look for a way to address um, one of these goals in your project. All right, next slide. So in Philadelphia, we started in 2018 with basically five broad questions, uh, categories for um, sustainable design, energy, uh, community, water, and materials. And it was good, it was a good start, and we got a range of responses. Some were very simple, a couple of words or a sentence, others attached a bunch of diagrams and data. So it turned out to be not that useful a tool for the jurors and the reviewers in the awards process. So 2019, we tried to find a way to refine it. Again, it's, it's really a tool for you, the architect designer submitting, to explain to the reviewers and the jury what it is about the project and its design that have goals and accomplishments that address sustainability in a significant way. So in 2019, we had expanded on the five categories and we had a, a sort of scoring system for each. And it was, again, a help. Uh, people couldn't work write too much in the narratives. Um, then next slide. Other um, chapters were also starting to wrestle with how to incorporate these um, sustainability criteria and the 10 measures into an awards program. Uh, this is a sample on the left from Austin. Uh, national level was coming up with what's called the common app, uh, meant to be a simple distillation into a spreadsheet from the lessons of the code top 10 awards process. There is, for, if you're submitting at a national level for one of the top 10 awards, there is a um, extensive um, toolkit for the top 10. That's a series of interactive um, spreadsheets and it looks for quite a bit of data and analysis and information. We're trying to make it much easier and more accessible for all of our members to be able to start to address. So next slide, we made a version of the uh, adapting the common app and the 10 measures into a format that we think is a little more user-friendly and um, the questions and data are easier to address. Uh, and there's a sort of how-to column that helps sort this out. So this was the first version for AI Philadelphia. Then next slide, this shows it as you fill out information in the spreadsheet, it interacts with that chart on the upper right. And each of the 10 measures has a kind of bar graph of um, accomplishment within that measure. Uh, the more blue, the more uh, you've been able to address in your design. It's not a score. It's not like a lead certification. It's just a visual graphic tool to help the reviewers look and see where are the strengths in this project, where the weaknesses, what should we be paying attention to? Next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so this is how that's broken up. Uh, without polling everyone, some of you I assume have may have worked with this form last year and are preparing for this year. So for some of you, it might be totally new and you, you haven't addressed it yet. So we will, um, work to walk you through it in a simplified way. Okay, next. Now we have a live spreadsheet and 
I hope you all can see it on the screen, or perhaps you've already downloaded it from the uh, uh, website. AI Philadelphia and Pennsylvania are essentially the same. The title at the top and the logo changes. And I think the AI Pennsylvania is preset to print out as a uh, uh, landscape format in six or seven sheets. So what you'll see here, and I think um, Jonathan's gonna start to fill in things as we go through. Um, let's see, can you show the blue, show the wider view? Uh, okay. So on the left, for, you know, again, it's a reminder that the form uh, and the chart on the top right will fill itself in. The first is general project information. This is the same information that you would have included in any design award data, the name of the project, the location, the address. Then there are a couple of things you see in the orange uh, cells, climate zone, and there's a pull down menu. Um, okay, so Jonathan's uh, typing in here. Go, go down to, yeah, leave that alone. All right. Now, the way this works is just about everything is a pull down menu. Uh, some are yes or no, others give you a choice. So, Philadelphia is a 4A, mixed humid, and that's the climate. So, if you need some help in determining where you are, there's a link to the climate zone map, and that would open up a web page that'll explain um, you know, all the climate zones around the country. Uh, and there's a whole number of them, and that's very helpful to make that decision if you're not aware. Then as we, as we scroll down further, and I guess maybe, maybe at this point, Jonathan, you're right, we don't need to see the blue bar uh, column on the left. We need to be able to see it on the screen, make it a little bigger. All right, so now you've got your basic building information. What is your primary use? And you, again, there's a pull down from a national standard. Uh, we could say, you know, medical, medical office building or healthcare or office or something like that, lab. And maybe it's 100%, maybe it's 90%, it's 80%, 85. Now you've got a secondary function. Maybe there's retail, food service, parking garage, whatever is applicable to your project, and you can round off to the nearest 5%, uh, and you can simplify it if you need to, if you have a really tiny amount of some unusual function. Okay, then there's two categories of project type. One is simply, is it residential or not residential or interiors? So if you have a commercial project, you click non-residential. Um, and is it new existing? reconstruction or historic preservation. So here you can click new probably for this example. Okay, now again, some data. Now you might, if, if you're entering this uh, and you didn't work on the project, you may wanna work with your project architect or project manager and get some of the basic data and, the other, and some of the questions that come up later. Number of stories, let's say five stories, four stories is fine. Uh, total floor area, 100,000 square feet. Uh, site area, say 20,000 square feet. Okay, so now that's built in to the spreadsheet and it'll show up in one or two other questions as we move ahead. Uh, daily occupancy. Again, your project design team has probably made a building code analysis or has some information to put in your best estimate of the number of people. Hours of operation, if it's an office or lab, it's, you know, 40 hours, maybe it's 50 hours that the building's really open and has people in, so you can enter that. Okay, and then there's three questions that are, the first two are yes or no. Is your firm a signatory of the AIA 2030 commitment? And of course, that's something we at Committee on the Environment are encouraging as many Philadelphia and Pennsylvania firms as possible. It's, it's a wonderful way to express our commitment to the environment in our design. It's not hard to do. We've had a number of presentations in the Philadelphia and statewide on that. So if you want some help, get in touch with us. And then if, is the project already certified as a green building? So if you're 
submitting something that you, you've received a LEED silver certification on or a Green Globes, Passive House, any of these that are listed, you pick one and there it is. Okay, that's all information that the reviewers can see as they're starting to look through the package. All right, then we get to measure one, and this is the first of the framework's measures. And as you scroll down, so was a design charrette. So, you know, there was a really nice uh, slide and introduction, part of what Jonathan just discussed on the 10 measures. We've tried to, I wouldn't say boil it down, but we've tried to make a, uh, a simple set of questions that you as the design firm can determine yes or no. Did you have some kind of charrette process workshop with consultants on the team, with the owners? Did you talk about saving water and energy and a strategy for the project? Uh, maybe you did it at the very beginning, maybe you did it again during design development. Uh, it's a great thing to do. Um, integrated project deliveries, another concept. So you can say yes or no. Then we've got room for a general project statement. So you'll also see in the column on the right, we give some prompts, some uh, suggestions and sample themes and ways to encourage you to enter uh, a brief narrative. This is a chance to discuss how the design of the project responded in, in, in your own way to some of the goals and the measures in this framework. And you get 120 words and you want to focus it. You want to point to the juror. You know, we had a, a unusual site and we managed stormwater with rain gardens. And, you know, that'll show up in your presentation photos. So um, that's a good way to uh, highlight what you want them to see. Then the next part is of all the 10 measures, we're asking uh, with this form and the same with the national common, pick two of the measures that you think the project design is, did especially well, that addressed with clarity, that made it part of the design that is really appreciable, uh, appreciated and visible and meaningful. Um, for me, it's, I find it best to do this after you've done the rest of the form because once you go through all the other measures, it's kind of a reminder or tickler that, you know, we did a lot of good work on materials and resources. Maybe that's one of the measures that we'll highlight. Um, or we had a really um, a well insulated building and not a lot of glass and the performance is terrific. So we're gonna highlight that. So you might wanna come back to that later and fill it in. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, you see measure one now has a bar that is filled in with blue on the graph. And that's because you were able to answer these questions. There's a yes and there's some answers. Very good. All right, now measure two, design for equitable communities. Um, again, this is, a, this is challenging to put in simple measurable uh, form, but one of the things that is across the board on the, on the framework is how walkable and transit use and what kind of bike sources, how can people get around in the community? So transportation access and choice is a, a good measure of an equitable community. Uh, and one of the great tools, I don't know if you folks listening have used it or not, the walkscore.com is an independent uh, entity created, I think mostly by real estate agents and by uh, academic uh, professionals that type, you know, put it in an address. I don't know, Jonathan, make up, make up an address. Uh, an actual, okay, that's fine. So there you are. Um, it'll give you a walk score for that entire zip code. Or if you put in a street address, it'll give you a walk score, a transit score, and a bike score. And also it tells you a lot more about assets in the neighborhood, what kind of retail there is, uh, what sale prices are, uh, crime statistics. There's a, a variety of data. So here at 2000 Market Street, where John works, 100 walkers, you can get anywhere in Central City. So it's intuitive, but this is actually 
a sort of crowdsourced data. And um, it's a good tool, 100%, 100 score for bike riding, uh, for transit riding and the 97 for bikes. Now you go and enter that data in, 100, the 100 and the 97. Now you see on equitable communities, you've already up to a third across the bar. Okay, so similarly, there are other questions and we've um, tried to follow the goals of the framework and come up with simple pull down menus. Uh, do you offer spaces for the community? Does it help with health and resilience, not just for the building users, but for people nearby? So you choose from that pull down yourself. Uh, was it designed informed by uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Is that a goal for your owner, developer? Is it a university and they were very active in this? You have to, again, make your own decision. Uh, was the community and public invited? Here, there's a range of uh, five or six levels of participation. Let's say you had a community design review board presentation and that, you know, it's a level three. There you go, non-stakeholders. And then there's a narrative. And here uh, we're encouraging you to expand on this little bit of data that's in here by highlighting in a few words, what were the important aspects of your projects that address these? Um, if you addressed it only marginally, you can be very brief. If it was important, you wanna make a statement out of it. Okay, I guess we could open for questions if anybody has a question as we go through. Uh, then, there, uh, there, there was one question, Sherman, maybe we'll pause, um, okay. that someone asked the question, does it count against you, against your firm, if you have not signed the AIA 2030 commitment? Um, and the, no. the, what's that? It, it doesn't, it doesn't count against you on the, on the graph. It's not part of that bar chart, but for the reviewers reviewing it, I, I guess it's really in a way up to them, whether they, uh, want to make that part of a, a way to higher rank a project. It, it wouldn't yeah. lower, but it might add um, something to it. Yeah, I, and I would probably guess, just practically speaking, it, it's probably not, you know, most reviewers aren't going to look at an exemplary project and say, oh, this was an exemplary project by a non-signatory. They don't, um, you know, we're going to give them a demerit for that. So it's, um, it's, it's probably, it may be more that, if they're reviewing it, they may um, have a they may have some sense that a firm that's a signatory and has reported projects may there may be more confidence in the in the some of the um, reported data that is reported for 2030, but it's probably pretty remote. Um, there are other reasons why we would strongly encourage you to sign, but probably not because you're not going to win an award if you didn't. Is right. what I think I would say. I don't know, Brian, if you would would agree with that. Maybe yeah. I wasn't supposed to say that out loud, and my I'm going to get my <laughs> my my code committee card taken away. <laughs> no, you yeah, you're going to get a visit from somebody asking you to at your house asking you to join the commitment. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Um, but in any case, I'm going to put in the chat the um, the link to the Philadelphia Coat uh, YouTube channel, and there's a lot of good um, videos on there about joining the commitment, and we have a whole subcommittee on the 2030 commitment, so we do really encourage you to, to join, and there's a lot of myths dispelled uh, in some of those videos about how, um, you know, how easy it is to, to join and maintain uh, the commitment. So, thanks, yeah. Brian. And I think there's a uh, session next week from the 2030 working group on uh, embodied carbon and how to address that as part of uh, our design process. So it's, there is a working group that is uh, accessible. Okay, so now we're up to measure uh, two ecos. I'm sorry, three, uh, where did we three. go? Measure three ecosystems. Um, this is basically, uh, uh, is it urban, suburban, or rural? And no points for that, it's just information. Then we have, was it a previously developed site? And as we know, that's important. And you'll have to judge. Let's say there was a site that part of it was 
built on and part of it was not, is it at least 50%? You, you make that determination. Was stormwater managed? Is there some way in which you've captured and used or detained until later that help uh, address stormwater, uh, perhaps with landscaping uh, materials? And landscape plants being native plants. Again, that's something you can ask your landscape designer or whoever in, in your firm worked on it. Do you feel comfortable saying yes, they're native plants or no? Okay, and does it promote di biodiversity? Does it help with birds? Does it help with, uh, you know, the, now there are pollinator plants that go in, in wildflower gardens. You have to decide. Um, and then there's room to discuss this a little further. Is there something exceptional or something just really well done about this, the ecological health of the site? Does it help users become more aware of the site? Did you use uh, you know, a very limited lawn, for instance, if it's a suburban site? So that's the idea. Okay, design for water is um, also trying to discourage use of potable water. So the first two questions are, did you use pot potable water for irrigation and for um, cooling? Uh, and if you know, chances are yes, if it's yes, then it, it, it's not a, you don't get a score. If it's no, you do get a score. So you can see that. Uh, and a slightly more advanced level, did you use gray water captured from the building stormwater or black or from sinks and labs to uh, use things? Uh, is rainwater collected and used? Um, do you use less water than code allows? Uh, and if you do, did you use at least 20% less like the, uh, the new water sense fixtures uh, that are pretty much on the market as standard now? Uh, and uh, is there some way during an emergency that people in the building or using the building for some period of time get access to water? And then here's a place to expand on, on that with uh, something that you did with the design of the project. Or let's say you, you use super high efficiency showers in your residential buildings and you're saving 30% of the water. You can highlight that here too. Okay. John's a good typist. All right. <laughs> um, design for economy, what the average square foot of the building is already figured out from the numbers up above. So now this again calls for judgment. Um, you know the project, you know the program. Um, uh, did you, uh, first, did you reuse an existing building? In this case, we've already said it's a new construction, so that answer is no. Um, is the design more efficient than industry standard? So if you were 200 square feet per person in a lab building, do you have some insight that 300 square feet is more common, so you really were more effective? And you can say yes. Um, and um, is the cost per square foot better than could be expected for a comparable building in this market? That again is a judgment you need to make or do some research. And then we have room for a narrative. You can describe some of the strategies that perhaps you had you know, conference room that also is a lunch room or as a presentation room or a meeting room. Perhaps there are ways you can serve space in an office layout, for instance. So you can enter that there. Uh, now design for energy. Again, we've simplified what could be a very detailed topic. And this is in three parts. First is all projects, whether you had an energy model or not, you should know your window to wall ratio, was it 30%, 40%, 50%. You should know what energy code you use, is it the IECC? Uh, and if it's in Philadelphia, that would be 2018. That, that already says a lot about how efficient the building is compared to earlier. Um, did you use the prescriptive criteria? So if you did a commercial building and you followed prescription, that's fine. If you did a lab, good chance you did an energy model, you did something a little higher performing. That's the next question. Did the design of the envelope or lighting exceed minimum requirements? 
And one way you'll know is if you did a comp check analysis, for instance, near the end of the job, it'll show you were 8% better than code. So you can say confidently, yes. Uh, whether renewable energy credits plant, that's not really a design of the building aspect. It's more as architects have we suggested our owners do that. Uh, also with third party commissioning, it's really great to work hand in hand with commissioning for the MEP systems, especially, and the envelope. Um, and that's a, that's a good thing. Now, if you did an energy model, again, if it's a, a lab building and a new construction, there's a good chance you did. What was the benchmark for the energy use? And EUI is energy use intensity. That's in a certain amount of BTUs per square foot per year. It's becoming a universal, uh, way to compare energy performance. So um, uh, John is entering a couple of numbers in there, like for labs, it's pretty high as a standard. So if you did some uh, energy conservation work, you could be much less than that. And then it calculates a 60% savings. Now the AIA 2030 challenge, years ago, it was 50%, then it went up to 60, 70. Now, as of 2022, it's an 80% goal. That's a real tough one, but you know they got to move the target to be able to get there. And John's trying to adjust the edit. There you go, 72. That's that's a great savings. Okay, and then it then it does yes. All right, now does it meet? Uh, I'm sorry. Was the energy model used to inform decisions during design? And you know often. A model is done maybe by the engineers somewhere in design development and they get some basic information from the architects and they show it's gonna meet code and that's about it. You know, Cause you've got a lot of glass, but you've got a high performance system, you balance it out. The goal of AIA and the framework is let's do that early and let's do it as part of design and let's see what we can do with the building envelope and systems and lighting to really make a difference. So if you're on the road of an energy model, you really should talk with the owners about doing that. Okay, then if you've done that, you've got a model and the building's at least a year occupied, are you able to get data on the energy use? That's not often easy. You know, we've done it sometimes, but not always. And to interpret it is a challenge, um, but then you can say it's compared to what you estimated in the model. And Learn from that. It's a, it's a good both learning tool and it really helps your owner manage their building if they've got this data. Okay. And then there's a, uh, a narrative for any additional discussion. So if you've done a building with exceptional performing glass and really insulated spandrel panels, you might want to mention that. If you've got a building with uh, a one-story building with a lot of roof and you've got an R60 roof assembly and it's helped tremendously. If you've got uh, systems that use uh, very sophisticated heat pump technology, saving a lot of energy, this is your chance to crow about those advantages. Uh, or just spell out what you did that was in any way uh, a little better than code. Um, or that you followed a more stringent code. That's valuable too. Okay. Uh, the next category, measure seven, is well being. Um, we've made some basic questions about uh, do you have operable windows for ventilation? Are there access to daylight in at least three quarters of the regular spaces? Uh, is the indoor air filtered? with MERV 13. So if you've got air filters in your system, they should really be high performance. Uh, does it promote healthy physical activity? Do you have open stairways so people can use the stair instead of elevators? Do you have ramps that make it easy? Uh, did you do a, a satisfaction survey? How was the temperature? How's the thermal control? How is it moving? Schools might do that, office tenants. And then there's room to write about it. And there are many other topics of well being, indoor air quality, and things you might have found important in your project. Maybe you tested for outdoor air leakage or uh, pollutants in the building. Uh, you can add that 
in the narrative. Okay, and then design for resources. Um, here there's a, a primary structural system. Uh, there's a pull down in that box, right? Yes. So you select, did you do, if it's a lab building, it probably steel with a metal deck floors maybe, okay. Uh, if, if you did a building life cycle analysis, then that's a yes or no. And if you did do it, then what is your um, baseline and what was your um, data per square foot? Uh, what's the reported embodied carbon? So if you have not, then you leave those blank. Otherwise, if you have done analysis, this is a place to put in. We're still looking for a more universal, easy way to analyze embodied carbon. Uh, we had one last year, people may have remembered that, but it's, um, it, it's a little uh, weak from the, the goals of AIA. Okay, then more talk about materials. Did you use local materials or recycled materials? Did you address polluting chemicals and healthy materials? Um, did you uh, reduce construction and demolition waste? Uh, did you work with the haulers to take that away and, se and separate it? Uh, did you promote the use of reduced waste by having uh, a, a place to recycle in the building? A separate than a trash chute, for instance, in a high rise, is there a recycling chute? Um, another question again about historic buildings. I think more and more we're seeing the value of embodied energy in existing buildings. So that's a Yes or no, if it's all new construction, you can't count it. And then there's room to add detail about this, uh, about this topic uh, in resources. Like for instance, if all your drywall came from a local plant in Pennsylvania and is made with recycled material, you might wanna indicate that. Uh, or if uh, you use less, less finishes and so there's less material, less carpet to absorb odors, you know, thoughts along these lines. Uh, mostly about, about, it's about resources, I'm sorry, not for, right, local material, recycled material. All right, now design for change. Um, this again is a way to think about the long-term durability and use of the building. In the, in the box on the left under how to, there is a standard uh, category of concrete and steel up to 200 years, heavy timber 100 years, metal or wood light gauge framing 50 years. So again, you need to choose from that and enter in a number there. Uh, if it's a lab, concrete and steel, it's 200, oh, 120. John, you think you want to interpret in between? Okay. <laughs> I'm um, assuming this is a building that has uh... Concrete and steel for structure and has uh, metal studs for the uh, exterior enclosure. So I'm splitting the, oh, splitting oh, the difference. Oh, I see, okay. Um, then future disassembly. Again, this is something that designers are now thinking about. For instance, a, a curtain wall system on a high rise went up as a big panelized system. It probably can come down as a panelized system and get used and rearranged, but it needs to be a conscious decision. Uh, flexible floor future uses. If you had an open plan office building, certainly part of it is fixed, the bathrooms, the stairways, maybe some meeting rooms. Other parts are movable, flexible. You can take partitions down and reconfigure. Um, do you address long-term resiliency and the future? What are the key hazards that might be there? Flooding or fire? Is the building more fireproof than necessary because you're near wildfire territory. So that's something you can choose yourself, yes or no. Uh, can it remain useful for, let's say a day at least, is there some kind of external power source, um, are there batteries uh, that'll help or solar power? And then a place to add um, comment about change. And you know, think of, uh, old the 19th century warehouses that are now into loft apartments. And that, that's a kind of change that we can be considering now as we're designing 
for the future. Okay, uh, the last is discovery. Uh, and this is both technical and there's a little bit, a little bit of, um, of uh, just something about uh, uh, joy in the building as well in discovering things. First is simply a post-occupancy evaluation. That's different than an occupant survey. It's more of a really walking through with the building management. How is the building performing? How is it holding up? What kind of issues are there? And if it's uh, unbuilt or not yet built, is it planned to do that? Will you be doing a case study? It's great when as architects, we stand back for a little bit, take some of the pictures and analysis and history of the design and do a case study of what have we learned from this project? Uh, are you collecting data? And it, again, that showed up in the energy category, but here it is important. Water and energy data, if it's being collected is terrific. And then can you compare it to a predicted value and share that prediction with uh, the public or even with, uh, you know, energy has to be reported in commercial buildings of a certain size in Philadelphia. So that's there. There's also the EPA's portfolio manager, which is a great tool for tracking and comparing your performance with others. And then room to explain uh, other aspects of discovery. The one thing we like to say is, is there some design detail about the project that people can discover or a design feature kind of siding or a view from a major space that people will say, oh, I see, that's, that's what there is to learn about this building on this site. Um, that could be exciting and it's worth highlighting to the reviewers. So here you see, we've walked through all of that in about 20 minutes and we've got the completed form and all of the um, bars are filled in. And that's, uh, once you start, working on it and you just go question by question. It's not that hard. You just need a couple of places where you'll need some help from your design team or you may want to contact an engineer that worked on the project, but it's not digging very deep. It's enough information that we think architects can know and find out and address. Okay, let's, were there other questions on the form from in the chat? I don't see other questions, but anyone can feel free to unmute and uh, chime in if you have questions or thoughts or we can, otherwise we can go back to. Uh, I think there was something from Olivia. Is that just? All right, yeah, I missed it. Oh no, that's not a question. That's how did you, okay. Um, and uh, to reiterate, for Philadelphia, it's required to complete the form for all projects, and then there will be coat projects that are awarded uh, and others. And then for Pennsylvania, it is a separate category. It's a voluntary submission. All right. Now, rounding out the discussion, again, back to the uh, lessons from the coat top 10 of 25 years almost. Um, Another great publication, The Habits of High Performance Firms. This is an insight into uh, some of the firms that have done uh, really exemplary work with um, environmentally responsive designs that look great and perform well. Okay, and then next we just added a couple of glimpses. These are projects from last year's AIA Pennsylvania and Philadelphia Awards. Uh, here are two houses the outlet house on the left in the city of, in Philadelphia, on the right, a rural house, rust house, both of them well-designed, both of them pursuing passive house guidelines. I'm not sure if they're certified, but they were um, beautiful designs, well-crafted, not enormous budgets and high-performing environmental. Next, similarly for uh, university buildings. Here are two. Uh, there's one on the West Coast, Henley Hall on the left, and Waterman Lab on the right from Ohio State. Both are very handsome designs in strong settings, bring daylight into the interiors. Both of those uh, submitted terrific packages for design and sustainability. And um, we have the 
links for our in Instagram uh, posting and the LinkedIn postings for um, our Philadelphia Pennsylvania committee. And if you if you follow more. yeah if you follow the link um, if you follow the link here um, uh, the QR code you'll get a, a form that'll sign you up for the Coat Philadelphia newsletter, which will have some more information about some of the stuff Brian had mentioned. But I do see um, there's a question. Is there a specific resource might be helpful to consult for the questions that ask us to compare our buildings to other buildings in the area, cost, et cetera? Um, and I think the, the one thing I guess I would say is there is in the um, on the um, Framework for Design Excellence website, there's a link for the top 10 super spreadsheet that has a number of tables of um, resources, but they are not local. They are sort of a nationalized um, listing of different resources by category. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we have, we would kind of defer to your um, teams, I think, to, to, to um, report on how does this apply to other projects that, that are uh, similar? Is that fair or there may be others? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Finding a resource about comparable costs. There's also just the RS means cost estimating books, which are usually available that give you a comparable for different um, uh, types of construction. There are some that are summarized and others are detailed part by part, um, but it does take a little uh, research, yeah. But it, it, it may make sense for some of the non, for things other than cost, there are other, um, you know, within that super spreadsheet, there are other sort of metrics of what's the, you know, right. typical office density per occupant per person or energy use intensity, you know, um, uh, baselines and that sort of thing are, are in that resource. Right, and I, I guess if we could find that a link to that top 10 toolkit, uh, could try to put it in the chat, but it is available through the AIA.org website system. That is a good question. Let me see if I can find that. Any other questions? This is that link to the framework that we mentioned, which is this web page. And if you go to this framework, you can download the framework for design excellence, or you can click on more resources slowly. There's a set of different resources that they list, resilience, equity, health, and zero carbon. Um, and I believe that the super spreadsheet is in this list, the habits of top 10 um, of, of high performance films is listed there. The code top 10 awards items are listed here. Um, and the architect's guide to building performance. These are all really valuable resources. Um, and this is where, again, where these case, case studies of the code top 10 um, awards are. And now I'm not seeing where the super spreadsheet has moved. Mm. Yeah. Let's see about the search. <laughs> but it does have a number of resources for specifically how we get there. Yeah, they did appear to reformat the uh, the web page here. Yeah, since we made ours PowerPoint. <laughs> yes. Where are we going to go back up where we need to fill in the top two measures? We could do that. Did we not do the top two? Well, we, let's see, we picked um, 
one measure was. Oh, I see. Yeah, good. So thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> so as we looked at this, which do we think uh, we, we might say are of these categories? Now, again, as Sherman said, this isn't really a score. This is sort of an arbitrary completeness check of how many of the things did we ask about that fit? But it may be that as we look through it all, we could say. Um, um, oh, it looks like change is a high performing category. And uh, so is uh, predicted energy or ecosystems uh, on the blue bars. Right. So that gives a clue. And then since this is a made up project, <laughs> I guess for a lab building to really achieve a uh, six, 50, 60% energy reduction, that's going to be something you want to talk about because that's a significant achievement. So I say energy measure would be one to discuss. And um, it said it was urban, so I'm not sure what the ecosystems are. Perhaps it is you know, roof, stormwater, and maybe there's an amenity terrace, or maybe there's a, a portion of it that is yeah. cap rainwater that you want to highlight. Yes, in my hypothetical building, we did a lot of things that in our actual buildings, we don't always get to do, so. <laughs> right. And I guess the other thing that we just want to say as we close out and then we should let people go because we're at time was, you know, the overall goal is that the form is there to help you understand and sort of jot down the different ideas. But we would be encouraging that if there are specific sustainability strategies that they are also included in the other parts of your package that it's, you know, if you did specific things about, um, you know, if, if you mention in the forum that the design was created to encourage activity and, and um, uh, you know, with stairs and ramps, we would expect that the rest of the package where you talk about the, um, the building, the images, the diagrams and narratives would include that. And we're not looking for the narratives that are in this form to be a dissertation. That's why the, the numbers of words are pretty low. We're looking for people to be concise, but just to help the reviewer looking at it say, okay, you put a yes here and we want to understand a little bit why. So it's just a few, a few words or notes or bullets um, does not need to be a, um, um, an elaborate dissertation. Jonathan, real quick, I was able to find the super spreadsheet and put the link in the chat. So if you go to the measure design for integration, there is a link on the right side to download the super spreadsheet. Wow. Oh, in, within our form, that's great. Yes, I forgot to indicate that, that in the Excel form, each on the right, each measure has a link. Very nice. I think. Now, of course, it's not opening up. But... You have protections to not accept links from spreadsheets. Oh, there you go. Yeah. No, so, it's just opening up in a hidden in a hidden yeah. screen. Okay, so there scroll we go. down. Yeah, there it is, a super spreadsheet. There we go. So yes, as we were scrambling to put the link in the chat, we should have said the link is in the form. Right. For each of those categories, if you're trying to understand more, there's more detail here with the, with each of these links. Um, that's great. Thank you, Hello. team. Yeah. Which, is, which is also a, a link, a segue to say that the form uh, can be used by your, your architecture practice during design, not necessarily only for making an award submission, but a way to discuss these um, measures as part of your design work with your design team internally with the client. It's a, it's a distillation of the whole framework into no, pretty much a simple to discuss spreadsheet. All right. On that note, 
I think we will stop. Um, and uh, that's all we need. That's I think that's all we need to do. Thank you all for attending, and we will talk to you all soon. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks. And uh, if anybody needs any further help when you're working on it, just uh, let us know through the AIAPA or Philadelphia.